Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? Today's guest is someone I met years ago in an ad agency. And while the career wasn't for me, I am so darn grateful for the awesome people I've connected and still keep in touch with. Kelly Small is one of them. Kelly is an award-winning creative director, designer, and writer with deep roots in communication design, marketing, and advertising, and a special focus on ethical and inclusive creative practice. Kelly holds a master's degree in design where their research focused on design ethics, social impact, social innovation, and sustainability. Currently serving as executive creative director at Grass Rides, Inc., Kelly is committed to applying their 15 plus years of commercial experience to exclusively supporting progressive, impact-focused clients. Kelly spoke to Conscious Creative, Practical Ethics for Purposeful Work, published by House of Anansi Press, is a collection of over 100 actions for ethical creative practice. It is the culmination of Kelly's research in their pursuit of a more humane, values-driven, and inclusive creative industry. In today's episode, Kelly shares the final straw that led them to reevaluate their approach in advertising, how the grass is not necessarily greener on the other side, and how empowering that realization is. Some of the practices that help them stay focused and present in their process, the good days and the bad, and learning to quiet their judgy inner critique. Don't we all have one? their overall experience of writing their first book, and so much more. Let's dive in. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. I, seeing everything you've been doing lately, I, I'm so excited for you. And I really wish you did that maybe 10 years ago. I don't know if I would have stayed in advertising, but still it's, you know, I'm going to show you here, The Conscious Creative. This is one of Kelly's latest projects. And I don't know where to start. Just welcome, Kelly. Do you want to start a little bit by um, just telling people about yourself, who you are? Yeah, what you sure. Do? Sure. Um, okay, so who am I? I am a currently executive creative director at a shop called Grass Riots. We work exclusively for progressive nonprofit companies. So I've pivoted uh, out of my original life, which was, as you said, in advertising, uh, for-profit work, working for all the big brands. And uh, I am someone who sort of started out as a teenager reading ad busters and being very critical of the marketing messages that I was receiving as a young person and how that was impacting how I felt about myself and my mental health. And then somehow I fell into advertising and I became the very person that I was critical of early in my life. Long story short, it resulted in a bit of a an existential crisis. And, you know, fast forward, I left the industry and went on this journey to, to write this book. And that kind of brings us to now. Yeah, Ooh, that's a really, really great summary. I'm like, where to start and all of it. I just want to add that you are radiating. I don't know what's oh. about it, maybe because you're doing work that you like I could just feel the energy thank you so much well I, I would say likewise likewise you, you feel exactly the same way and I know you've pivoted into a place where you're doing more values-based you know purposeful work um that kind of aligns with like who you are and like what you want to put out into the world and um it does it make it makes such a difference and when I you know took the plunge as I'm sure you can attest to it's not an easy thing you know, it's, it's so ambiguous and full of unknowns and you have no idea where you're going, but I'm very grateful to say that like following 
that path and like just continuing to like set that intention every day and make the choices that led me to where I am now. Um, I, I never imagined my life would be where it is now. And like, yeah. granted, things are not super easy <laughs> given the state of the world, but yeah. I feel very grateful for where I am. I want to dive a little bit more. You mentioned, you know, taking the plunge. It's overwhelming, especially because you've spent 15 years of your career building, you know, climbing the corporate ladder, getting into that version of success. How did you know what were some signs that it was not right, mm -hmm. that it wasn't a place for you? Yeah, that's, uh, God, there, where to even start? There were so <laughs> many signs. Um, maybe I'll start with like a very personal sign, which was the level of anxiety that I had every day. I, I was, uh, and I've always been someone who's uh, struggled with my mental health, with anxiety and depression. Um, but what I've learned over the course of my life is the, those symptoms can also be a really good uh, indicator, really good information for whether or not I'm on a path that is aligned with where I want to be going, who I want to be in the world. And I was unsure of myself in advertising. I didn't uh, buy into or believe in the messages I was espousing. And so that felt bad. Um, I had to be complicit in selling products from companies that I knew had problematic supply chains, that I knew were using, uh, you know, labor practices that are, are just, you know, abysmal and, and really affecting people's lives negatively, contributing to overconsumption. Um, I experienced a lot of like homophobia and transphobia and misogyny and like you, like I've seen all of it and racism, my God, it's such a, especially when I started like such a white industry and such a male industry. And it was, it was the combination of, you know, all of those sort of internal things that were happening like in agency that I couldn't agree with, but then the work itself, as much as I love creative and I love to make things, I was doing it for these corporate, like these organizations that were not benefiting society at all. Um, and in fact, like it's not even that they were sort of neutral, they were doing harm um, psychologically, environmentally, social, to the social fabric. Like when I really started to like wake up and think about it, I couldn't unsee it and it, it's uh, it was incredible how how difficult it became to just like get up and go to work every day and um, that's I think where that that anxiety came from that was sort of free floating at the time and I uh, I didn't quite know for a, a period of time where that was coming from but um, I eventually figured it out and my working life and experience is a lot different now and and I can mm -hmm. say that I'm in a place where I, I feel a lot better every day going to work yeah oh, that was I like how you position it you know having anxiety even those little signs that a lot of us we avoid we don't like I had a lot of anxiety too but I I just thought it was stress mm -hmm. instead of seeing it as a sign that I'm out of alignment I wasn't able to sleep and I, I thought it was just stress. I'm working so, but I knew something wasn't right. And I love that you position it. You know, those aren't necessarily bad things happen to you, but are signs about your inner alignment. That's, it's terrifying because we don't want to deal with those things, but it's important to recognize when those signs come. It, it is terrifying. It's completely terrifying to, to um, come to that realization that the the way you you've uh, designed your life or fallen into your life perhaps is not not very well designed for you <laughs> is um it is just not working it's perhaps not working for anyone and you know if I look back historically at you know sort of the peak I would say of of that anxiety and and of the time when I was really quite unhappy um, as a result of all of this I wasn't a great friend. I wasn't a great kid. I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a great sibling, like all, all of the things, like it, I, I had no capacity to sort of give back anything of, of a lot of value to the people in my life either. And so it, uh, it's a, it's a very big jump to 
address uh, priorities being out of alignment and then decide to make that shift because it's really scary and it often goes against everything that we're told, which is just keep working, just keep earning money, buy the house, buy the car, do the thing, be successful, whatever this success is that we keep yeah. telling you it is. And you know what? It's not. It's not oh, it. Yeah. And you, in your book, um, The Conscious Creative, it's, you have a lot of tips for younger professionals to follow through. And one of the most important ones, well, one of the ones that really stuck with me was self-care. Because like you mentioned earlier, you, even the different areas of your life get that ripple effect if something is not aligned. And it's, you know, you mentioning, you know, I was not a good daughter or your friend as a result of that. So how did you know out of everything that was happening that it was the job that was the most straining for you? And how did you know this is what I have to do and change? Because with all those emotions, you know, where, do you, where, do, where does one even start? For sure. So, um, I mean, real talk, it was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I got really sick. I, I ended up with shingles from stress, which is like something that, you know, often much older people get yeah. <laughs> someone who was in their mid thirties. Um, and I had, uh, I had no idea which direction I was going in. It took a really long time for me to figure this out. And I, um, all I knew at the time was that something was wrong. And I think because of how uh, unwell I became and how unhappy I was, I, I kind of just took the plunge and said, like, I'm out of here. I sold my condo. I sold my car, like, got rid of everything and, and went out west and, you know, was privileged enough to be able to attend Emily Carr, do my master's of design there. And I said to myself, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, like, take this time and I'm I'm going to explore and I'm going to you know, ask the big questions, try not to be afraid of them and um, see what comes of it. And, um, you know, as a creative person, we all know that there's that sort of messy front end of creating something where you're just not sure what is going to materialize. And that was an incredibly hard place to be when it was uh, more of a, a life design. <laughs> like, yeah. Actually, like, oh my God, what the hell am I going to do with the rest of my life? I'm in my mid thirties. I've like left my career behind all these things, but uh, you know, very long story short, because it was not, it was not an easy time and it got worse before it got better. But I uh, was, you know, walking down the street one day with my now wife and uh, turned to her and and said, I, I, you know, oh my God, like I, I think I've been asking the question all along that I really want to, that I really want to know the answer to. And I was trying to figure out my thesis question and like what I would research. And it, it really came to me that um, I wasn't sure if it was even possible to uh, ha have an ethical practice to live a sort of values-based life within such a problematic capitalist system. And I wanted to find out if that was accurate or not. And so uh, that's kind of what I started embarking on and where I found, you know, dialectical thinking and, and the idea that, um, you know, everything is indeed incredibly problematic and, and mm -hmm. also that coexists with our own kindness and our own compassion and our own incremental change toward a better world. And um, while there are certainly you know, many areas uh, of work that need more immediate attention, I think it's also okay for us to be uh, comfortable and, and like allow ourselves the sort of break to not fix everything immediately or try to fix everything immediately, but instead have that intention and like move through the world in a way that is just like a little bit more aware. Right. Wow. Yeah, because it can feel very overwhelming. When I was in the industry, I think I just wanted to help people. I wanted to do charities. That was my main goal. But then even sometimes in the charity roles, it's problematic because they just take money from people. They're not connected. So that's like a whole other elephant there. And, you know, you tackling something as big as ethics. What was some of the most surprising or daunting facts you found out about when you started digging deeper? 
Good question. I mean, you just hit on something that I I found uh, quite profound also, because because same. It's I think when you're in industry, you're in for profit. You have this like the grass is greener on the other side, mm -hmm. which is if I go into the nonprofit field, then. I'm just magically helping everyone. I am like completely extricated from all of the problems and that is complete bullshit. We know that that doesn't exist and there's no such thing as any industry that is not problematic. We don't know where money is coming from. You know, some charitable organizations are not anti-oppression, are, you know, I'm very lucky to work for an organization that is quite discerning about who we work with and, and refuses to, you know, support a charity that you know doesn't align with our values, for example. Um, but that that was uh, that was quite an awakening and also quite a liberating awakening that it's like, listen, you know, as long as humans are involved and you know we're all sort of trapped in this current economic paradigm that we're in things are going to be inequitable. So there's no, uh, it was like being liberated by the fact that there was no escape. So it's like, okay, I can do this anywhere. I can do this work anywhere. It's just, it's, I, I have to take that responsibility on myself. I can't say, oh, there's an industry over there where I can just dive into and then like kind of shut my brain back off and go back and do the yeah. work. This is an ongoing practice that has to happen every day. It's so empowering, right? Because we tend to give our power away and think because of this, you know, that's why we have plastic because that's how the company is created. But knowing that you do have power and, you know, might not change everything, but it's the start. Exactly. Oh, Kelly, I need to like tattoo that <laughs> somewhere. Oh, wow. So once you started to pick back the pieces and put everything back together, how was that process of, okay, I'm coming back with a book. I think this could help. How was it kind of coming back into the industry? Hmm. Is it like coming back? <laughs> uh, yeah, it really was. Cause I was, I was gone for like a solid three years, I would say a little bit of freelance here and there, but I was, I was pretty gone. And I, I had also really removed myself from social media, which was amazing. And like, maybe oh, yes. never done for myself. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, admittedly, I'm like w right back into it. And yeah. um, <laughs> I've complicated relationship to social media like the rest of us do. Um, yeah. I think it's wonderful and I think it's terrible and all the things in between. Um, but when I came back, it was so scary. It was so scary. I had realized like so much of my identity prior to that period had been wrapped up in my title, in who I was in relationship to an agency, in like my earning potential and what I was bringing home financially. And then I kind of arrived, you know, I, I so I I finished my degree and I had this book and it still hadn't been picked up by a publisher. Um, but I came back to Toronto just like, again, it's like, okay, well that, that part's over. Like now what? And I was just this free floating agent that I, you know, people ask about people and they often respond with like, well, this is my title at work and this is what I do. And I didn't have that easy answer anymore. And I had to sort of, so, so that was um, big, a big piece of learning for me was, was sort of uh, dismantling that notion that like my identity and my value in the world had to be related to, uh, you know, my productivity in relation to capitalism, and to work, things like that. So that was one piece that was really hard. Um, the other piece that was, I mean, you know what? It was, it was all a journey. I know I'm, I'm going on a little bit now, but I'm just like, I'm, I'm kind of in this moment of reflection and thinking about, oh my God, like, I can't believe this has only been like a year and a half since I've been back. This is, this is new stuff. Only a year and a half. I've only lived in, in this place for, oh my God, since like July. 
not this past July, but the one pre previous. So yeah. this is stuff, and you know, I got married last year, and I have a bonus kid. Oh my god! Like <laughs> I'm a parent, um, and it's great, and she's very cool. So it's it's been a wild ride, and like I I came back, and I was terrified, but I, um really leaned on my on my family and uh i happen to have a partner who is so supportive of me and and believed that it was possible that i could you know write a write a proposal for a book mm -hmm. and send it to publishing companies and that people would be interested and you know what she was right which blew my mind and so everything since then has really just been so uh, it's been gravy. Like people often ask me about like my expectations about how the book's doing and all these things. And it's like, just the fact that I'm here and I have something in the world that I feel is meaningful is like, that was the dream. That's it. Like I got to put that in into the world. I every so often get like a DM from a young designer, like somewhere there was someone from Australia the other day yeah. who said that it, it, you know, changed the course of their career and, like, that's wild. It's like you said up front, like, I can't even imagine what my career would have looked like if I had had this sort of guidance right off the top. Yeah. Like that's, and, and now it's in um, its course material uh, oh. at universities and some colleges. And it's just, yeah, it's cool. It's, it's yeah. really big. How does that make you feel? Kind of proud of myself. I think yes. it's just because like, you know, I'm the first person to admit like, the the privilege of um like what i've what i've had and where i've landed and all of these things and also i've like certainly come up against my share of uh challenges in my life as well and i think especially from a you know mental health perspective sometimes i just look back and it's like wow you like you've really pushed through something that was very 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 challenging and uh in order to to create this thing that is actually helping people so it's like you know it's like the definition of heartwarming it's it's yeah. just the loveliest feeling in in the whole world oh uh, and it's it's something that everybody needs to get their hands on if you know, right, whether they're creative or not because there's so many timbits in there that are ap applicable for you know every scenario you know from our takeout containers to, you know, reading a book, like where was this printed? Everything. I love it. I loved it so much. I can't like stop talking about it. I want to ask something specific in the book. Sure. Um, you mentioned the four factors in building a sustainable creative act, uh, practice, personal, economic, social, and environmental. How did you narrow down to these four? Ah, yeah, so those come from something called the quadruple bottom line of sustainability, which is uh, something that was coined, um, at least in the way that I understand it and in relation to like creative industries by this uh, scholar called Stuart Walker. He's a, he's a UK design researcher, does a lot of speculative work, really, really cool, interesting, deeply thoughtful person. Um, and he proposes that in, in order to establish really sustainable sustainability in relation to uh, the development of anything, you need to uh, factor those four elements. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, you know, would it work if I apply that to the, you know, knowledge in this book in order to help me craft something that has the potential to be uh, long term and sustainable for people's lives as a, as a way of implementing it. And so, you know, fingers crossed that has been successful, but that's where that came from. Oh, and it's still pretty fresh. How long has the book been out? Oh, like four months. Only four months. Oh. <laughs> It's, uh, what, what is it? I guess it's December now. So, uh, August, September, October, November. Yeah. So like five months, almost five months. This year has also time is wonky for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Likewise to have something like this happen in a year where like the whole world kind of shut down. I, I, I don't know which way is up and like what day it is like the rest right. of us, but but you still got it out there and people, I'm pretty sure a lot of people getting inspired in these 
times of <laughs> almost lack of hope, but they're like, hey, there's a little bit of light here. Yeah, I mean, I've I've definitely gotten that feedback that the timing was uh, pretty pretty perfect. And while there's uh, certainly no perfect timing for uh, something as devastating as you know a global pandemic and like the way it's you know taken people's lives and affected people's lives, um, and also for the people who yeah I think need a little bit of light, a little bit of um, optimism, and and even a little bit of silliness because it's a pretty irreverent book. Like it tries. Mm -hmm. A really you know traditionally serious topic and give it just a little bit more life and, and a little yeah. more, I don't know not take itself quite so seriously it's really nice to be able to to bring that to people at this time for sure yeah especially during a time there's so much unraveling in the society as well like from the inside out I hope more things are coming out it can be not pretty but so so necessary you need to rip out the foundation <laughs> Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that, that part is always painful. <laughs> yeah. So how did you work around it when you were doing the research, when you were like deep into, oh, you know, all these unethical practices and all these bad things are happening? How did you, I guess, from a self-care perspective, keep yourself from spiraling? Such a good question. Um, and interestingly, a topic that I'm exploring as a, as a subsequent book to The Conscious Creative. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are a few things, and I think, you know, it's always important, and I always am super honest about the fact that it, it was terrible when I first sort of became aware of these things. And I, I absolutely had the crisis. And then as I got into the work and as I sort of established the the direction I was going to take that was this sort of middle ground that accounts for how problematic certain things are and that there are not necessarily ways of circumventing them but small ways of subverting from within um I I did a lot of yoga <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was I was doing yoga and I I desperately want to get back to this practice but I would say over the course of of writing that book I I was doing yoga every day sometimes twice a day like in a very uh like deliberate uh, like I was very deep in the practice and so I would say you know, at the time I was, I was telling everyone like yoga saved my life right. um, because it reconnected me, uh, with my body after a period of time where I had been like, so kind of stuck in my head and, um, I walked a lot. I was in Vancouver, so I had, the, I was in the West End, so I had the seawall there and the mountains and, you know, it was, um, it was, it was really beautiful. And, and, you know, I, I spent a lot of time solo, uh, kind mm -hmm. of, kind of finding myself again and you know I, I ate really well like these I was just I was I took really good care of myself like once I sort of got through the really hard bits I was like okay I think it's time that I actually do all of this really mindfully or I'm going to completely collapse and so yeah. those practices uh, definitely definitely got me through and I I don't think that the book would have taken on the dimension and like I don't know the depth and maybe that's just me, but that it did if I didn't have, you know, the yoga practice, I was doing meditation, like just, just reconnecting and, uh, and listening a lot more deeply than I had in probably, you know, ever. Yeah. You bring up such an important point of kind of bringing your body along. Mm -hmm. I totally identify with the part with you know, everything is spinning in our head, we have the solution, and an idea comes, and we, at least as creators, we can get lost for hours just pursuing that and neglecting our vessel, the rest of us. So it's so important how you, you said, you know, okay, I got over the ugly part now, it was time to kind of bring everything together, like physically, mentally, to be able to, I guess, go <laughs> to the other side. <laughs> yeah. And I think I think it's important also uh, for people listening, I, I always want to be really careful about not presenting the experience as linear, Yes. right? It, it's like, if I'm honest, you know, I had a rough week this week and I haven't been very in my body and I haven't been treating myself as well as I could. And 
it's it's a constant evolution and a constant practice and i think the most important uh thing that i learned out of all of all of this is a level of self-compassion when i don't get it right mm -hmm. um, or when i don't get what i what i thought i was supposed to be doing at that time um mm -hmm. how i not um we're we're human and we're fallible and living is hard life is hard and um you know it's okay it's okay to rest it's okay to take space it's okay to um eat something that's like not great for your body you yeah. know if you want to all, all of these things that like i feel like i spent my life judging myself over is just i i found a way to relax and i think that was probably the ultimate self-care is um is allowing that and like turning off the like the judgy me who yeah. was telling me that i was garbage yeah. i think we all have a judgy person <laughs> inside for the worst thank you thank you for bringing that out the self-compassion the allowing ourselves to not have only good days because i think part of the experience is you will get the bad days you will it doesn't matter how much yoga you do it doesn't matter if you're out of alignment if something's not working and like even if we're not in a pandemic we're going to have shitty days and we can't avoid those but being able to look through a lens of compassion it's so important and crucial and especially something that i've learned about myself because i tend to be very mental in a way that everything can spin in my head and I feel like this energy just gets stuck in my body and being able to let it out, whatever physical form, walking, punching something. I did some boxing. That was a lot of fun um, back in the day. But yeah, like addressing what your body needs. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, who knew? I didn't know until I kind of fell into it as a, uh, because I was so anxious when I started yoga that I kept signing myself up for yoga classes. Yeah. <laughs> leave and like get to the front door and be like you know what there is no way I can move my body in front of other humans right now and so what I ended up finally doing was like finding someone on YouTube to follow and then that became the start of my practice and yes it was like oh my god okay this doesn't have to be this like perfect yoga experience that I see reflected everywhere. Like I can wear my like shitty jogging pants. <laughs> I can look a mess and yeah. still get a lot, possibly more out of it because I'm not so self-conscious. So. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Starting where you're comfortable. I think we have this perception or these ideas in our mind. That's probably thanks to marketing or just social media that we think this is how things should be. And uh, I love that story. Even for you, it might have not felt good back then to like book a class and leave. But I think if we had this compassion and this awareness of what we need, we would struggle a little bit less. Still hard days, but maybe less pushing ourselves to fit something that's not for us. Yeah, and less like, less compounding the pain, right? It's like, okay, you're having a bad day anyway. So... Yeah. Then on top of that, you're going to talk shit to yourself about the fact that you're having a bad day and make it twice as bad because you're not just like giving yourself what you clearly need, which is like rest or extra care or some kindness. Um, that, that was like a revelation, like a massive yeah. revelation to me. How, how did that connect? How did you I oh, guess, therapy. embrace like, that? <laughs> <laughs> I came from uh, my amazing therapist who I had at the time who um, just identified the fact that I was like really beating myself up and uh, and put it in those terms that I, it was something that I was that I was compounding the struggle, which mm -hmm. was just I was like, oh, OK, well, when you put it so like plainly like that, it's like, yeah. why the hell would I do that? This is a terrible <laughs> idea. Right. Just, you know, like, go have a bath and like not be an asshole to myself. Yeah. 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 Uh, we all need those people in our lives that can reflect back to us <laughs> with love, but also tell us when we're not being kind to ourselves. Totally with the real talk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Kelly, so many aha moments for me. I, this has been such a fun conversation. <laughs> uh, I guess some questions for younger creatives. 
we touched on it a little bit about how overwhelming it can feel to there's a lot of tips and actions and we might not be able to tackle all of them. Would you hope that's one thing they can get out of the book? Not to narrow it down, but just one yeah. thing. That is a very good question. I think, I think what I hope comes out of it without like identifying a specific action is you know, it's, it's sort of framed as this book of, uh, you know, mindful, practical ethics. And mm -hmm. I mean, as much as I, I am, I'm not a psychologist, I am not, I'm, I'm only a mindfulness practitioner in the sense that I, you know, that's a part of my own life and my own practice. But I hope that that's what comes out of it is this sort of, you know, high level understanding of the importance of like, just being aware just setting the intention going into the world and and gently and kindly returning to the intention to you know look for those little moments where there's an opportunity for change um yeah i think i think that would be the overarching thing because i think most of us all of us arguably have a great moral compass in there somewhere and it's like when you're tapped into it and you're aware of it, the rest of it kind of just comes, right? Like you, if you yeah. really start to listen, like you know what's right and what's, what's not for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Has that feeling enhanced now that you've, I guess, leaned onto it more? Mm, it's, um, it's a good question. It feels like... I still, you know what? I, I think I want to answer that with like, I still make mistakes. Of course. I absolutely still make mistakes. And I have to fight that voice mm -hmm. because I've put this book into the world and there's like a certain level of accountability that I'm feeling in this topic space mm -hmm. that I didn't necessarily have before because I didn't have like, that connection. And so... I guess that's like a challenge that's come up for me is having to remind myself that like all of those lessons that I'm espousing like have to apply to me too and I have to be gentle and I have to be kind and like I'm gonna fuck it up and that's yeah. okay and just like get back on and like keep going keep trying um yeah I would say that's that's the only thing but but generally speaking it's uh I'm 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 happy moving through like my work life in this way and I'm very grateful again to like work for an organization that aligns with those values so it's not that same uphill struggle in the way it has been in in you know other work settings before mm -hmm. yeah. how does your work day look now my work well I <laughs> <laughs> my my favorite part of my day is that uh myself and my wife and our kiddo go dog spotting in the morning. So we don't, we don't have a dog right now. Winston is still around, not to worry. He lives <sighs> on the street. He yeah. and, um, he's not great with kids. So that became oh. a problem. But um, uh, Evan, uh, our, our little kid is, uh, she's obsessed with dogs. And so we go dog spotting every morning. Yeah. We get up at seven, we like get bundled up. We go out, we like try and pet as many dogs as possible. And then, you know, we come back and we're all working from home in our, yeah. we have a condo, so we're kind of on top of each other, but we do our best. And I mean, my day looks like, it looks like a lot of meetings. It looks like a pretty <laughs> cool, I think, ECD role um, for like a small to mid mid-sized agency, but it also includes a lot more, uh, emotionally checking in like yes. we have a management meeting and I must say about like you know some of my colleagues are so great they're always like okay let's just start with checking in let's see how everybody's feeling today I was like what <laughs> like what do you mean you care about how I feel right now yeah just my productivity so that's <laughs> very very cool um there's also like quite a heavy focus on ensuring that the uh, the organization is uh, inclusive and supportive and you know really uh, living the uh, the values that that we speak about publicly and 
um, that doesn't mean, again, that we get it right all the time. And, and there's a long way to go for a lot of these things, but it's, it's on the radar and it's, it's a part of, of every decision that gets made. So that's awesome. I would say yeah. that's probably the biggest difference between like, you know, former agents of life and, uh, and now, and the rest is just cool. It's just, you know, getting to design, uh, campaigns, pretty small campaigns, but that's okay for, yeah. you know, some, some great organizations that are, are really making a difference in the world. So that part feels amazing. Oh, that's nice. I, my favorite part is the dog spotting. I would totally, in normal circumstances, come tag along with you because that's what I do with my husband. We don't have a dog either, just because we've never had one growing up. So I don't know if I can take care of one, but it's like oh, getting a dog or just a pet. It's this unconditional love, even from like a stranger's pet. I'm like, come, you want to come to me? Okay, I'll just snuggle you. <laughs> Well, you're always welcome on our dog spotting mornings. It's it's a more the merrier affair. And so if you ever want to come up to the upper beaches, there are a lot of doggos in our area. Yes. So I'll take you up for next summer, maybe when right. I can wake up early. That's a uh, to do. Like I think we, we count them too. So our, yeah. our, uh, our, our highest number of spotted dogs is like 24 now, I think 24, oh, 25 in a morning. Right? Yeah, what a treat, and that are up at the same time as you are. <laughs> we've uh, we've found like the perfect time. A good slot, a good slot. Oh my gosh. Um, we might have already covered this, but what do you do now when you feel stuck, disconnected, or have a bad day? Hmm. Um. I mean, other than like the stuff that we all do, which is uh, like complain to my wife <laughs> or, um, you know, collapse in front of the TV at the end of the day and just like yeah. shut down, which I also think is perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. um, I, what I've realized about myself through this process and, and having this, this project as such a significant non-work related project is how meaningful that is for me. So I think that that is something is is kind of having something not um, directly related to my working life that I can return to that feels like it's just mine and that I have like creative control over it. It feels very much aligned with what I want to put out into the world. And so um, I think that like return it, returning to that, you know, opening up a notebook or a laptop and starting to either do a little bit more research, start to gather some insights, even just like stream of consciousness, kind of what I'm thinking at the time as something that will, you know, hopefully make it into a, por a part of the next edition of the book, um, these kinds of things. Oh, how was the process of writing a book overall? I loved it. I yeah. like, I know some people talk about it like it's such a slog, but oh my god, I don't know if it was just like where I was in my life, but I had so many people when I told them I was going to write a book in this like short, fairly short period of time. Um, like the, the, I would say like to get to the first manuscript, it was probably like a year and a half uh, from like research to like completed and bound book. Um, and I, I got up every morning, I made my coffee and I sat in front of my computer for usually until about two o'clock in the afternoon and that that's when I would then like go do yoga go like have a big walk take the dog out like all of these things um I loved it I found it like so peaceful to just be quiet and be creating and like be so immersed in this like big long-term project which you know as someone coming from advertising where you're constantly pumping out big creative ideas really fast and then it like disappears as fast as it came yeah <laughs> lovely too and I, my brain fought against it at first to be honest as well it was like what like what is this what do you mean I don't have a pro like finished product and I've been doing this for three months like yeah. it was just really fathomable to my brain so once I got used to that it was like this I don't know, it was like comforting to get up every morning and like have this like purpose, this thing, this greater thing that I was working toward that I loved so much. So like, don't get me wrong, there's always going to be like the tough days, but it was, it was pretty great. I really, really loved it. I can't, I can't wait to get back into that phase of writing. 
Yeah. Was it a healing experience as well? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, the, I would say the, the research part was probably the most healing out of all of it. like the some of the writing was was really great as well especially like the more personal bits and but I found like by the time I got to the writing part so much of like the the work had been done it was just like I was translating it when I was writing mm-hmm. um you know learning uh learning to to uh formulate my own sort of new idea about like what a what an ethical designer and ethical creative actually looks like which was quite different to many of the books that I read and a lot of the papers that I read which tended to um, really extricate design or creative work from the marketplace and talk about it only in terms of like its benefit uh, to like humanity uh, to the environment important and also what wasn't often being talked about was it's um, the fact that many of us have to earn a living within the realities of this context. And that's what yeah. I was searching for. And so that was, um, you know, really one of the most healing places is when I started to figure out that, uh, you know, I, I could, I could design what this meant for me mm-hmm. and that I could sort of design a way to live my life that felt less oppressive, that felt less, soul crushing um that was that was the part that like really changed stuff beautiful thank you for sharing that part was it how was i guess my next question is what happened after you deliver the book the manuscript what did you do after that because i sometimes i have this project i'm chasing behind and then when i'm done my life is kind of like oh should i take a step back do i stop now (laughs) Yeah. Um, what did I do? So there were a couple different phases. There was, there was the original manuscript, which was kind of just for me. And it was, it was really a piece of my, uh, my thesis. Mm -hmm. And so like finishing that was cool. And also I knew that there was more I wanted to do with it. So, you know, I wasn't like allowing myself to chill too much. And then when I got interest from a couple publishers and then I ended up signing with House of Anansi, uh, I don't know, I just, I like squealed a lot yeah. and like, jumped up and down and was just really excited. And when I delivered that, uh, the manuscript and knew it was about to go to print and become like an actual physical book that I can hold, like it's, it's so, it's so wild. Like when they, when they delivered this to me, uh, for the first time. And like, I, I tore open that package and just saw that like, th- this is a thing. And now I like, I see it at Indigo and I see it at independent bookstores and it, yeah, yeah, it is a, it is a level of satisfaction that I, I definitely like hope I'm not, you know, overstating or coming across as like boastful. It's more oh, just, not like, at all. I can't believe that it happened. Yeah, no, that's the energy is, it's contagious, you know, even though the part where you were figuring out it's it's never the fun part the rock bottom part it's so worth it because once you're in alignment once you're doing something that aligns to your values you start to you know you have a different energy about your day and everything feels lighter even the tough days exactly exactly yeah which i'm very i'm very glad to be at that phase at this particular juncture in my life i'm so happy for you too and for what you put out I wanted to wrap it up with some rapid fire questions. I know they're a little bit deep, but um, I'll start. What's the best compliment you've ever received? Uh, <laughs> best compliment I've ever received. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, this book has, has completely changed the course of my career. I would say is really good. <laughs> a book that's changed your life. Bad Feminist, Roxane Gay. Oh. What does coming home to yourself mean to you? Uh, coming home to myself is uh, 
acting in a way that is is in alignment with my values and and so there isn't that uh, dissonance between those two things that that's what feels like home mm. what do you want more of time i think time i think i want um you know, I, I wish that there were fewer work days, you know, and so that uh, more time could be dedicated to these projects that mean so much to us, but that, you know, are relegated to like weekends. Right. Same here. Same here. <laughs> Any advice for your younger self? Mm. Advice for my younger self. You know what it would be? I, God, this is like, I don't even know how this is going to come across, but you're not a bad person. I would, t I would say you're not a bad person. You are in uh, uh, settings that don't work for you. You mm -hmm. don't, you're not like a lot of the other people around you. Um, you think a little bit differently. You are a little bit different. And none of those things mean that you're fundamentally bad they just you'll you'll find your way you know i i misunderstood those sort of differences for uh being bad for a long time and uh yeah that would be that would be the big one i felt that too thank you for sharing and finally where can people find you oh they can find me so i am at kellysmall.ca that's probably the easiest because it's um, just has a little bit of everything that you need, like socials and everything are available there. But also I'm pretty active on Twitter these days. So at Kelly underscore small, because there's another Kelly small who got the good one. And then when I asked her about it, she blocked me. So we're not talking anymore, apparently. <laughs> That's okay. I'm comfortable with Kelly underscore small. <laughs> Okay. Remember, <laughs> it's not the same Kelly in case she doesn't respond to you. It's not the yeah, same exactly. one. <laughs> she definitely doesn't want to hear from you. <laughs> um, I guess, where can people find your books? Your book. Ah, so, so anywhere. Um, if you're, uh, if you're in Canada, then I would say, uh, go to your local indie, um, support those folks now more than ever. That's really, really important. Um, you can get it at the House of Anansi uh, website. You can get it at Indigo. You can get it at Amazon, like all the usual suspects, but I highly recommend indies. And then if you're in the U S it's, uh, again, all the usual suspects plus like Target, Walmart, um, uh, bookshop.org is the one I tend to like nudge people toward in the U.S. because it's, uh, I can't wait for us to get this in Canada, but it is a, an amazing platform that like funnels the, you can buy it at a central location, but it funnels the money to your local bookstore. So it's a really, really cool platform. Um, I think it has recently opened in the U.K. as well. So if there's anybody listening from there, they can get it there as well. But uh, yeah, it's pretty much anywhere. You can Google it. Yeah. I'll attach the links too. And awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly, for your amazing energy and sharing your story. Thank you so much for like for having me for <laughs> and, like for your kind words about the book. It's like it's really it's really, really meaningful. And um yeah, like I just so you know also like I, I loved working with you when we worked together. Oh. Um, I have such like, I know it wasn't a super long period of time, but I have such fond memories. You have such a lovely energy and that always really stuck with me. And so it's just like, it's such a pleasure to see that you also have like been on this journey and, and found something that is obviously really speaking to you. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm also like incredibly happy for you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review on iTunes. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.